Brian Burrow, Barbarians at the Gate, The Fall of RJR Nabisco. Welcome to the intriguing world of leveraged buyouts, LBOs, and corporate power plays, told through the summary of Barbarians at the Gate, The Fall of RJR Nabisco. If the term LBO seems unfamiliar, you're in for an exciting journey into the 1980s, an era marked by the rise of LBOs, the astronomical growth of Wall Street, and rampant corporate greed. Dive into the story of RJR Nabisco, and how Ross Johnson, an ambitious CEO, set about transforming the company with the help of Jerry Kohlberg, Henry Kravis, and more. Throughout this summary, we will explore the origins of LBOs, the rise and fall of RJR Nabisco, and the legacy of these corporate giants. Origins of Leveraged Buyouts Leveraged buyouts, LBOs, born in the late 1960s, were initially created as a solution to help wealthy business owners preserve their family wealth and dodge hefty estate taxes. Jerry Kohlberg, a lawyer, devised a slow but effective method that involved founding a shell company with external investors and funding the buyout with bank loans, insurance bonds, and personal funds. Consequently, the target company would shoulder the massive debt, while the original owner retained some control and investors acquired the business at a discounted price. Originally, leveraged buyouts, LBOs, were tools to preserve family wealth for business owners who faced heavy estate taxes when retiring. LBOs emerged in the late 1960s, catering to a generation of individuals preparing to leave behind their business empires. Normally, these owners could either pass their businesses to heirs and bear the full tax burden, sell their companies and lose control, or take their companies public and expose them to market uncertainty. To protect family wealth, Jerry Kohlberg, a lawyer at the time, developed a solution. Say a business owner, Mr. Big, planned to retire. Kohlberg's strategy involved creating a shell company and attracting investors who would secure large loans to buy Mr. Big's company. Although Mr. Big would have to give up partial ownership, he would maintain some control, and the investors could buy the business at a lower price without engaging in bidding wars. Notably, the funding for these buyouts came from a mix of sources. Investors contributed just 10% of the cost, with insurance bonds covering 30% and bank loans accounting for the remaining 60%. As a result, investors made a minimal investment while acquiring the target company for a fraction of its worth. However, this approach had downsides, as the target company inevitably assumed a mountain of debt. Over time, LBOs have gained a not-so-favorable reputation, often associated with corporate greed and Wall Street's unchecked ambition. Nevertheless, it is worth remembering that LBOs began as an innovative means for business owners to preserve their wealth and secure their legacies. Unraveling the LBO craze. In the early 1980s, the phenomenon of leveraged buyouts, LBOs, swept the market as investors discovered their profit potential. This craze was primarily prompted by the U.S. Internal Revenue Code's allowance of interest tax deductions and the emergence of high risk junk bonds. Despite the criticism directed at LBOs for their implications on companies and employees, these tactics fostered a unique transformative ability that streamlined businesses and demonstrated their undeniable impact. In 1982, Gibson Greetings became a prime example of the burgeoning LBO phenomenon as the company was bought for $80 million by an investment group that had paid only $1 million upfront. Just 18 months later, the company was made public and sold again for a staggering $290 million. This tale exemplified the profit potential of LBOs, leading investors to dive deep into this tactic. In fact, by 1983, the number of LBOs had increased tenfold compared to four years prior. Two significant factors fueled this LBO frenzy. First, the U.S. Internal Revenue Code allowed deductions for interest tax while neglecting dividends. Consequently, companies were incentivized to take on debt and interest payments instead of profiting. Second, the inception of junk bonds, high-risk speculative investments, enabled companies to swiftly amass large sums of money, transforming LBOs into fast-paced, aggressive takeovers. As with most revolutionary financial tactics, LBOs faced both praise and criticism. 
On one hand, they allowed investors to trim and optimize businesses, leading to increased value for firms. Companies acquired through an LBO were forced to cut costs wherever possible due to the substantial debt burden. However, these same debt burdens became the primary source for criticism. Officials warned that the leveraging process might spell bankruptcy, leading to job losses for employees and severely impacting shareholders. With this context in mind, it is evident how the LBO craze unfolded and how it continues to impact industries, setting the stage for some of the largest leveraged buyouts in history. Rise of a Corporate Maverick Ross Johnson burst onto the Canadian business scene in the 1950s and became a quintessential example of a new type of businessman, more devoted to investors than companies. Fueled by a love for luxury, travel, and celebrities, he played the corporate game ruthlessly, leaving chaos in his wake. He began his rise to power in a Canadian sales job and found a valuable mentor in Tony Peskett, who instilled a mindset of constant upheaval. Johnson thrived in this environment, quickly ascending the corporate ladder. In the midst of the 1950s, Ross Johnson made his entrance in Canadian business, starting at the bottom rung but showcasing a distinct approach. He embodied a novel type of entrepreneur who would hop between companies, devoted more to investors than to organizations. This risky approach reaped incredible rewards, and Ross developed a passion for luxury, travel, and rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous. He frequently purchased extravagant properties, dined at the finest restaurants, and mingled with the likes of American football hero Frank Gifford and tennis icon Rod Laver. Although Ross reveled in affluence, he often turned a blind eye to the consequences of his ruthless strategies. He had no qualms about liquidating entire departments or relocating entire sectors just to advance his position in the game. He was always ready to sacrifice countless pawns for one valuable piece on the board. So how did Ross achieve such power? In Canada, he began with a modest sales job and worked his way up. It was in a position at T. Eaton, an old Canadian department store, that Ross met Tony Peskett, who became his valuable mentor. Peskett was infamous for pushing business and management into a state of continuous turmoil, rattling both companies and markets alike. Despite critics condemning this approach, arguing that it caused needless chaos and destruction, Ross Johnson found it immensely beneficial. Embracing the mindset of constantly shaking things up, he deftly navigated the tumultuous landscape, swiftly moving up the ranks of the corporate world. Unleashing Corporate Transformations In 1976, Johnson seized an opportunity as CEO of Standard Brands and leveraged the knowledge from his mentor, Peskett. Johnson targeted a merger with the considerably larger company, Nabisco, which was successfully producing well-known products like Ritz and Oreo cookies. Nabisco's conservative culture was shaken up when it merged with standard brands, adopting a more chaotic and invigorating approach to business. This transformation continued when Nabisco merged with RJR Reynolds, a giant in the tobacco industry. The merger faced cultural clashes, but ultimately aimed to present growth opportunities for both companies. When Johnson became the CEO of Standard Brands in 1976, he wasted no time in taking his business acumen to new heights. As the leader of the Canadian packaged goods company, Johnson was determined to take on a massive challenge, merging with the industry giant, Nabisco. Nabisco, famous for its Ritz and Oreo products, was a well-established powerhouse by the time the 1980s rolled around. With a conservative and secure corporate culture, employees worked a standard 9 to 5 and job security was high. However, the merger with Standard Brands turned this culture on its head. Standard Brands employees injected a chaotic, innovative energy into the workplace, sparking ideas and challenging norms. Johnson wholeheartedly fostered this new environment, facilitating the transformation of Nabisco's business culture. This impactful shift would later continue when Nabisco merged with RJR Reynolds, a tobacco industry titan known for innovations like the pre-rolled cigarette. The merger between Nabisco and RJR Reynolds aimed to create a wealth of growth opportunities for both firms. However, blending the more ostentatious corporate behavior of the northern-based Nabisco with the traditional values of the southern-based RJR Reynolds sparked cultural clashes. 
For instance, while Nabisco managers frequently traveled in limousines, their RJR counterparts had barely even seen the luxury automobiles. Despite these differences, the merger illustrated the power of embracing change and fostering a creative, dynamic corporate culture. Titans of Corporate Takeovers Ross Johnson's rise to fame as the king of shaking up businesses was about to face a new contender, Henry Kravis. Kravis was a Wall Street banker excelling at leveraging buyouts, LBOs. His approach was drastically different from his peers, taking patience and persistence to finalize LBOs instead of quick and brief transactions. Unappreciated at investment bank Bear Stearns, Kravis left with his cousin George Roberts to join Jerry Kohlberg, the father of LBOs, in forming their own private equity company, Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, KKR, in 1976. Under KKR, Kravis turned LBOs from insignificant tax shortcuts into formidable mechanisms for corporate takeovers. While Jerry Kohlberg was content with small deals, Henry and George were adamant about pursuing bigger ventures. The ambitious cousins believed that whether it was a $100 million deal or a $10 billion one, the amount of work was ostensibly the same. In 1987, key players in the LBO industry began securing pools of investor money for further LBOs. However, the Kravis cousins wanted more. They aimed to establish an immense investment fund and demonstrate their dominance in the world of colossal deals. Fresh off their extraordinary deal with Beatrice Foods, KKR started to procure funds for their own war chest. By waiving management fees for the first few years, they enticed even more investors, ultimately amassing a staggering $5.6 billion, double the amount compared to their competitors. The insatiable aspirations of Henry Kravis and George Roberts exemplified a new era in the industry, where they didn't settle for mediocrity but instead chased extraordinary opportunities, revolutionizing the world of corporate takeovers. The LBO Fiasco of RJR Nabisco In pursuit of raking in substantial profits from a leveraged buyout, LBO, Johnson orchestrated a deal for RJR Nabisco with investment banking firm Shearson, inexperienced in the LBO world. Their eagerness to partake in the lucrative deal led them to agree to impractical terms that threatened the LBO's success. Besides, inexperience in handling sensitive information allowed leaks, leading to disastrous repercussions for the deal. Johnson understood the immense profits that could be reaped from a leveraged buyout of RJR Nabisco. However, his greediness frightened major players, such as KKR, from participating. Consequently, he partnered with Shearson, a novice in the realm of LBOs. Craving a share of the LBO market, Shearson accepted ludicrous conditions, including an enormous portion of the deal for Johnson and commitments to maintaining specific budgets and retirement packages. Unsurprisingly, conceding to such stipulations jeopardized the austerity measures crucial for a successful LBO. These measures involved downsizing departments to repay the debt acquired throughout the transaction. The key to a successful LBO lies in discreet and ruthless execution. Senior executives should collaborate with investors to craft a buyout plan and establish a share price offer. When presented to the board, the opportunity has generally advanced to a point where they have little choice but to approve it. However, if the board rejects the proposal, corporate raiders lurk in the wings, ready to purchase enough shares to seize the exposed company. In Johnson's case, the inexperience of Shearson and other novices involved resulted in premature leaks of critical information. This lack of discretion proved detrimental to the deal's outcome. Overall, Johnson's tale serves as a cautionary example of the consequences when inexperienced players and greed combine in the high-stakes world of leveraged buyouts. The Doomed LBO Battle Johnson's leveraged buyout, LBO, bid for RJR Nabisco faced imminent failure as he and Shearson proposed an ambitious $75 a share offer, totaling $17.6 billion. The board, not fond of Johnson, entertained other offers from KKR and First Boston. Ultimately, the board had to choose between KKR's increasing bids and Johnson's persistence, as First Boston failed to secure financing. 
Johnson's ambitious LBO bid to acquire RJR Nabisco started with a seemingly impressive $75 a share offer, which was $4 higher than the company had ever sold for. This amounted to a whopping $17.6 billion, more than double what any bank had ever loaned for a corporate takeover. Upon hearing Johnson's proposition, the board, who was not fond of his management style, released a press statement and opened the floor for other offers. This decision led to a flood of competing bids. A special committee was created to secure the best deal for shareholders. Two offers shone brightly amidst the competition, KKR offered an attractive $94 a share, while First Boston, leveraging a tax loophole, was ready to offer a staggering $105 to $118 a share. Sensing Kravis' imminent entry with KKR's bid, Shearson hastily upped their game, raising the bid to $100 a share in an attempt to outshine Kravis. The colossal bids of First Boston sparked a second round of bidding. Final offers were requested from all contenders, and First Boston was asked to demonstrate their funding plans. Ultimately, First Boston could not secure the necessary financing for their ambitious offer, leaving the battle between Shearson and KKR's increasing bids, both hovering between $108 and $109 a share. In this intense scenario, the board was left with a crucial decision, surrender to KKR's dominance or hand Johnson a reluctant victory. This high-stakes LBO bid was testing the mettle of everyone involved, as Johnson's seemingly strong initial offer turned into a fierce struggle for control over RJR Nabisco. Charmed life and corporate greed Ross Johnson, the man at the center of the RJR Nabisco leveraged buyout, LBO, deal, lived a charmed life, caring only for people within his inner circle while treating everyone else as insignificant. This self-centered attitude ultimately led to his downfall, as the company's board favored a bidder that promised to prioritize employees' welfare. Despite his legacy of corporate greed, Johnson's salesmanship and lack of ethics allowed him to continue a thriving career in the United States, eventually entering semi-retirement and forming a consulting firm with a friend. Ross Johnson, an emblem of corporate greed, ensured those in his gang enjoyed life to the fullest, while he was utterly indifferent to everyone else. This indifference, fueled by viewing company employees as expendable, played a crucial role in the board's decision against him during the RJR Nabisco LBO deal. Johnson's reputation further took a hit when a New York Times article exposed the lucrative deal his team sought, triggering harsh backlash nationally. This media-fueled criticism was deemed another blow to the company's already tarnished reputation. In response, the board's special committee chose KKR, a bidder which vowed to prioritize the company and its employees above everything else. Despite the LBO deal not meeting everyone's high expectations, KKR avoided dismantling RJR Nabisco and successfully introduced order to the company through their experience. With KKR's takeover, Johnson's time at RJR Nabisco came to an end, and his departure was welcomed by all. Johnson's legacy is one of excess and corporate greed. However, his extraordinary salesmanship and unapologetic lack of ethics enabled him to maintain a prosperous career throughout the 1980s. He seemed unfazed by the entire RJR Nabisco LBO affair and entered semi-retirement laughing about it. Johnson later formed a consulting firm with an old friend, both enjoying giving unsolicited advice to others, without needing the extra revenue from their new venture. As we reach the end of our journey into the world of leveraged buyouts and the battle for RJR Nabisco, we see the stark human costs of corporate greed and excess. Despite his brilliance as a businessman, Ross Johnson's unscrupulous practices and lack of empathy cast a long shadow on his legacy. Although Johnson did not emerge as the victor in this LBO war, his story teaches valuable lessons about the corruption of power and unchecked ambition. Through this riveting tale of turbulent mergers, ruthless takeovers, and lasting consequences, we bear witness to the delicate balance between wealth, power, and the human spirit.